Welcome to another weekly Market Insight where we try to sift through the noise to get to the signal to give you actual advice so you can make informed decisions. Well, that's hard to do right now. With There's so mm -hmm. much noise, it's really hard to do signals. I'm joined by uh, this week with Chris. Uh, Chris, how are you doing this week? Doing all right. Hey, mm. You starting to feel like me? You're losing some hair or yeah. anything like that because of all the stress? A little bit, yeah. A little bit, yeah. It's uh, it's been a rough one, and it's it's really a market that's hard to actually start to uh, analyze and start making predictions out of. So we wanted yeah. to spend some time really just saying where we are, mm -hmm. uh, wh what we're doing, and and kind of you know one thing is inflation risk is still very high. We've been talking about that. I would say it's it's substantially high. Usually that means that the economy is doing well, and there's not a, a big chance of a, a, a recession or a pullback. But I think that we can say that that probability is also fairly high, and we're going to get into that and what that means. Uh, so uh, why don't we jump in? We'll look at the chart, and we had been saying that 4,200 is probably a good number. We'd see a lot of flow coming in. Uh, we went under that yesterday, uh, did come back a, a above, so that is still within our view that saying 4,200 is probably where a lot of money is getting uh, put to work. I know retail, we're getting a lot mm -hmm. of clients calling in saying, hey, we're, we're off the highs. At least I know I'm not buying at a high, mm -hmm. and we're we're encouraging that yes, it's it's okay to put some money to work, uh, but I wouldn't put everything to right. work at this moment. I think there's still a likely uh, a chance of of some further pullback, uh, but I would also go out and on a limb and say we've probably seen most of it at this point. Yeah, uh, and we had said that la a couple few weeks ago back on the rate hike, uh, and then we went into a new crisis. Uh, any any well, comments? A, a lot of volatility. Yeah. Yesterday, you know, market opens down one percent recovers two and a half percent and closes down again. So we're having large intraday swings, even some small movements off some false headlines. And like you said, trying to overanalyze the day to day is, is probably not something you want to do because um, the market's just moving headline to headline at this point. Right. Uh, one of the things, uh, a term that I remember from the Marine Corps days is just the fog of war, uh, where all of the information channels are, are just pumped up to the loudest volume. Uh, and nobody actually knows what is it accurate information or not, and I, I certainly feel like uh, that 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 describes what we're we're in right now. Uh, if we look at just how the indexes have been moving since uh, two Thursdays ago, uh, the Wednesday before we said that we thought it would be a low probability event of invasion. We're looking at the market, saying, well, when you look at currencies, it doesn't seem that the market is pricing uh, the high likeliness. And then we woke up Thursday and realized, well, that that. Uh, low case scenario is now the base case scenario. S&P 500 has certainly uh, sold off. I think clients are well aware that the market's down. Uh, but comparing that to, let's say, uh, emerging markets or really inter uh, in the international, let's say, Europe, mm -hmm. uh, the, those areas have been hit much yeah. harder. And I was just going to say, our models have been pretty flat with the benchmark. So compared to the global portfolio, we haven't really lost ground against it. We've been moving down with it. Um, we're less allocated to the international emerging markets uh, and developed space, but we're a little more allocated domestically to some of the stuff that went down. So those kind of balance each other out to be uh, matching the, the global right. portfolio per performance. In, in the previous scenario mm -hmm. why we're moving down, we have talked about being hedged. We weren't taking any bets. We were looking more mm -hmm. like our benchmarks. So I think that's good. Bonds are not so. They're, they're, they're not at negative losses, and I'm sure if you're on the long dated ten, uh, treasuries, uh, you see some upside m uh, movement, but r they're not responding in the way that is that risk off world. Just before moving on past uh, emerging markets, I just wanted to say that um, the MSCI and FTSE Russell have removed Russian stocks from the index. They, the Moscow exchange is still closed, so they wrote those down to zero. So that's a two to three percent decline just from the direct exposure to Russia in, in emerging markets. Right. Uh, and then uh, talking about just, we have been favoring equities uh, over fixed income for quite some time. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, yeah, the, the yield the, curve. The yield curve. So the red line here that we're looking at is last week, and the blue line is, is yesterday's close. And this is the topic we've been discussing for a while now, and the yield curve is, is flattening. Um, so if we look at the little graphic there at, at the two-year, we see the two years up over 30 basis points since last week, and the 10-year the did not move up as high. Tell us a little bit about the presentation. Yeah, so we're, we're looking here at the, the 2 and 10 spread, so that two-year yield and, and the 10-year uh, yield, and we're also looking at the dollar index, the Dixie, and they inverted that so that they could show how these are moving together. So as that spread's coming down, generally the 2-year the yield is rising, and he's showing that that's supportive of 
a strong dollar on, on the short end. Right, and I think a lot of people are surprised whenever they hear strong dollar, because uh, when we're looking at how much money has been uh, uh, pumped into the system, how mm -hmm. much inflation we have, uh, there's all kinds of reasons why you would expect a weak dollar. But I think what people are, are, are losing sight of is compared to what. Uh, so if you go to the other currencies, they're, they're doing similar. And our yields are actually a lot of times higher than the, uh, the other currencies. Uh, so it, th this has is, is certainly uh, caused that risk off mm -hmm. and a little bit higher yield to, to yeah. weight it out uh, in the dollar versus others. But as the spread declines, it gets concerning for the equity market and the economy. And this just looks back historically at when there is an inverted yield curve, so when you get a higher yield on that two-year over the 10-year, and it's been a good uh, indicator for future recession. It actually has a record of 100% accuracy. Mm -hmm. uh, I expected that record on the last time that it dipped, whenever we get the, uh, the, the lockdown recession, mm -hmm. uh, to not have happened. Uh, obviously, the lockdown, it, was that being predicted by the, the two to 10-year? I guess of a, an efficient market yeah. hypothesis person would say, yeah, sure, it was. We just didn't understand it. Yeah. I don't know how that works, how, how people no. don't know that it's going to happen, but they're predicting it. Um, I, I, I won't get into the technical variations, but this is certainly a, a, a very good indicator and mm -hmm. one that we, we we'll look. We'll watch closely, yeah. right, and because and the spreads are down in the 20 to, to 25 basis points on, on the 2 to 10, so it's getting a little bit tight. Right. Uh, we would, we would want to be defensive if all of a sudden we peek down below that mm -hmm. uh, where we get a negative yield curve. Uh, now, as gloomy as all this has sounded, uh, it, there the market, depending on what sector you're investing in, at least since the Ukraine inva uh, invasion, there are different markets for sure. If you've been heavy energy, which very few people would have been. Uh, you, Extremely you're small portion of, right. of the portfolio, of the market portfolio, right? So right. what's been performing well is, is small, so then it's not really s completely supportive of the index. Right, so then, uh, so energy is up, uh, followed by utilities, uh, which is kind of a, a, a odd combination. Typically, uh, utilities is a defensive stock you're being defensive whenever deflation is happening in the, the market. So we, we have inflation and a recession uh, priced in. We also have some staples and other things. So this is looking like an inflationary recession signal if you just look at this. Uh, we'll get further into that. But let's go outside of the U.S. Uh, let's talk about international. Uh, and uh, w if, if we're looking at this rotation graph, I won't go into the detail, but it's basically just comparing the different parts of the international world that you can invest in. What's hurt the most? Obviously, Russia. Russia is the one that's uh, been hit the hardest. Uh, but Europe is not far behind. If you actually want something that's working, you got to go to Brazil uh, or uh, Indonesia, somewhere outside of the Eurozone uh, to, to really find something working. And if we go into their sectors within uh, the international, surprise, surprise, energy, consumer staples, utilities, once again, inflation, and uh, defensive stocks are the ones that are holding up well. Uh, so uh, it, it's certainly kind of that value rotation, but for all kinds of different reasons than what we would have been saying, let's say, a year ago, uh, whenever we're seeing some value rotation. Uh, and that gets us uh, to this next slide, uh, which can't really see what... It, oh, commodities. Uh, commodities. Commodities. Yeah. Uh, they're all just bar charts at this, <laughs> this level. Uh, and if we look over the last 11 days, basically a basket of commodities across the board is up. And certainly if we go back six months, mm -hmm. it's, it's not that energy's up or that agriculture's up. They're all uh, up. Uh, metals, everything. Uh, the one thing over the last few days that isn't up would be livestock. Uh, and uh, maybe it's just noise. Or oftentimes what happens is farmers are seeing grain prices go up and other prices go up. Uh, and they want to call the herd, kind of reduce their costs uh, and get that to market. Uh, so I initially there can be a, a drop in the price of meat as more supply comes on. We saw similar things happen during the, the lockdown whenever they were doing things. Uh, so I just kind of consider that livestock point, mm -hmm. the, the noise. But we're, we're definitely seeing commodity prices increase everywhere. Yeah, so we and if we look at it, I at any moment, at this morning we could see energies down uh, substantially. Mm -hmm. If we can get some of these tensions done and, and figure out the energy problem, I think a lot of that price of oil is going to come out. Uh, but we still haven't seen how this goes through the agriculture, and there's a, it's very energy dependent. Uh, and I don't think it's priced in for even a pullback mm -hmm. in energy. It's still priced at around 50 to $60 a barrel. Uh, and I don't think we're going to get back to that anytime uh, soon. Glad to be wrong on that. Uh, and then... Not to say the other versions of investing in commodities are tax efficient. 
if you're going to be buying futures contracts, you, you can't be tax efficient, but you can be a little a little bit better. But in this environment, it just makes sense to have commodities. We mm -hmm. tend to not like to hold them in taxable accounts because of that tax uh, inefficiency. Mm -hmm. And in addition, we also have some energy stocks uh, in those strategies, mm -hmm. and we didn't want to really double up on energy because uh, energy has really gone almost straight up. It's par parabolic. It's nice to see this morning a little bit of that pull off just to get a relief rally, uh, even if you want high prices. Uh, to see something go up like that is, uh, is very uh, unstable long term. Uh, so across the, the board, that commodity index is up. It, it's up, and it does scare the market and scares the economy. We can look back at the last few recessions, and, and going back 2000 and 2008, of course, there was a lot of other things going on causing those recessions. But jump up in commodities um, often does uh, lead towards a recession that follows. Right, and uh, I think this scenario is a little bit different than mm -hmm. these previous ones. Uh, I don't think that the outcome is necessarily going to be different, but for different reasons. Uh, so historically, when you're looking back at these commodities, we have inflation and the Fed begins to tighten to try to slow the inflation, and then there's uh, a, uh, a, a, at some point, some type of liquidity component where you just can't get cash to do the investments that you want, uh, at least at the interest rate that you want. So a lot of that comes off, and that typically causes the recession. This one really isn't operating that way. It's it, The prices are going up not because uh, of an economy that's working well, but because of an economy that isn't working well. So supply is actually uh, coming up. And I wanted to hit this slide. This is our dashboard we like to look at just to have different points over the overall economy as well as finance to try to see what's the risk of a, a recession or a pullback. Uh, and we see housing, manufacturing, transportation, even recession probabilities, probably going to come down on recession yeah, probabilities, mm -hmm. are all still fairly high. And I think a lot of this is just prices are high in these areas. So let's take retail sales. We can see a retail sale come in high. Well, if a lot of that is because of the, uh, the sales at the gas station, at the pump, because gas prices are high, that may not be a good thing. Those uh, seeing retail sales numbers that are high, whenever it's basically inflation, that that's not necessarily a strong economy uh, there, and it's going to uh, pull back on some of the consumer spending. We'll look at our graph. We can see the consumer spending is actually dipping. So this, oftentimes, would be seen as positive. We're starting to see some rotation coming out of that, uh, 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 kind of some warning signs uh, from the previous month. But I, I I'm going to disregard those as probably just higher prices due to inflation on some of these things. Uh, and then if we look and compare, well, what happens whenever we get into uh, these inflationary environments and we go back, because uh, it's been a while since we've been in an inflationary environment. Uh, and what we're doing is we're looking at the S&P 500 and we're, we're changing it based on the CPI number. And we can see that we've had some uh, market recessions, even though the market may have been going up, they're losing value. Uh, now, the thing is, is you would want to go into bonds, but we've already talked about how that's probably not a good strategy here. Uh, so what we're thinking is maybe we need to add a little bit more commodities, but the problem is, is they're already so high, and if we can get some relief in these political tensions, they should come back. Mm -hmm. Now, are we going to get those relief, that relief and, and kind of looking uh, abroad? And there's just so much going. The, the slide has got a lot of noise. Don't read it. Uh, I'm just going to go through it. It's mainly just so I can... Uh, remember all the points <laughs> I'm going to make, and there's tons of other things that you can make here. But taking Ukraine and, and Russia out of the system, Ukraine because it's invaded Russia because of sanctions, uh, platinum and palladium are very, very, uh, they're, they're necessary to create catalytic converters for your cars and emission standards. So CAFE standards are probably not going to go away. And we've just gone through a used car price spike, driving CPI headlines for quite some time uh, because of chip shortage. Well, now, if we have an, an inability to, to get access to uh, the emission equipment and create the emission equipment for cars, I can also uh, put a crimp on it. Neon, uh, Ukraine is a big uh, uh, exporter of neon, and those are needed for lasers. One of the things that we know we need is more ability to create more chips or semiconductors. You need lasers to do that. So now a, a crucial component to lasers is also uh, in, uh, in short supply. Wheat, corn, sunflower oil. Uh, Ukraine is a, a big exporter of these. Uh, it's considered the breadbasket of Europe, uh, and it's great farmland, and there's a lot of people that are buying from them that are already politically unstable. So we have the geopolitics that are unstable because of the invasion, but then there could be hot spots in Egypt and Turkey and, and elsewhere because they're big importers of their, uh, their foodstuffs 
that are no longer online. So do we have even more political unrest elsewhere and have more hotspots? Ammonia and potash, I'll just throw those together, basically fertilizer. Uh, both of these countries are, are big uh, exporters of the, the basic commodities for fertilizer, which would continue to put upward pressure on foodstuffs. Uh, so there's just a lot of things to work through, all of which is saying commodity prices are probably gonna continue to stay elevated from here. So the, the next question is, well, if all we need to do is reduce attention and get out of this and get things working again and all of a sudden this comes down and it goes away, how can we do that? And uh, how could we replace basically the oil supply uh, that is taken off market with the, the sanctions and, and, uh, and companies uh, just refusing to trade with uh, Russia? Well, what are the options? Well, Venezuela. The U.S. and Venezuela relationships have been very poor for quite some time. They were a large exporter of oil. Uh, that has not been happening. Uh, they have a lot of problems in their economy, and the Biden administration is actually going out there. But once again, the, the relationship between uh, the U.S. and Venezuela, and really Venezuela and the world, is not the greatest. Uh, so there would be some political pushback or sacrifice. Well, Libya is offline. Uh, Gaddafi was killed, and, and their economy is uh, pretty much offline for quite some time. Probably not going to be able to do it, and I don't know that they're really excited to work with the U.S. either. Uh, and then Canada is saying that the uh, Keystone XL, not Keystone yeah. Pipeline, um, yeah. I'll call it the Keystone Pipeline, but <laughs> XL is just the additional component to the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, Canada is saying, get that open, we can, we can fill the gap. Uh, and possibly, but the politics say that's probably not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And even if you, they said, yeah, no, go ahead and do that, it's going to take quite some time to get a pipeline uh, built and constructed, probably years, and hopefully this is done and gone by then. Uh, well, what about just turning on the spigots? we got yeah. all these shale oil, right? What? That's what Conoco said the other day. They're like, everyone says, just, just turn it on. Like, turn it on. It's it like a light me, switch, right? It takes me eight months, and yeah. Pioneer said eight months. It takes us 12 months. It's like the lockdown yeah. thing, right? The economy can just be turned on and off mm -hmm. and no problems. It just, it, that's not the way it works. Uh, and... I don't know that the oil companies are really eager to increase uh, supply. They have been in a bear market for quite some time. Uh, prices are finally at a level that they're basically flush with cash. And investors of those, they just want the cash. They don't want new CapEx because they're looking at all the ESG mm. and other things, and they're saying this needs to be a cash cow. We will, we're probably not going to have fossil fuels at the level that we have going forward. So once again, a lot of politics involved there, plus... I don't think the oil companies are eager to give up uh, uh, some profit margin after uh, what they've gone through. Uh, and then Iran, they, I think they have 180 billion barrels of, of oil floating around in tankers that could be uh, pushed up and, and removed. But once again, the politics there. Uh, there just isn't an easy solution that comes through this where there's not a lot of roadblocks. Uh, so far, the thing that seems that to get most traction is Venezuela. So that just shows you uh, kind of where they are at whenever they're picking Venezuela after the last decade, really, relationship. It's quite surprising. Uh, so then I want to talk a little bit about just earnings on how this is going to yeah, impact. Yeah, it's, it's the earnings are coming down. But so far, the, the, the black line there is uh, Q1 earnings expectations from bottom-up analysts. Those are uh, looking at all, all the different companies of the index. And we haven't decreased by much. We've been slowly decreasing down about 1.2% on the year. And you can see the blue line is the S&P 500 down much more than that because we've been so used to two years of earnings beats, raises, and these earnings expectations have actually been going the other way where we've been used to them putting their expectations higher. Now they're a little bit lower. Um, probably have a little bit more to go down. Um, this is still, this is only through February. Um, takes some time to get the data, but mm -hmm. uh, not, not supportive yet. And then, what? oh, just as uh, closing out Q4, um, a lot of companies still have supply chains. So the 341 companies still mentioning supply as a as an issue. Earnings were strong before. We were talking about projecting out next quarter. This is looking backwards. Earnings at a 31% growth rate, and the guidance was an issue. So companies giving guidance, 57 companies, which is about 70% of those that provided guidance, were what uh, FactSet calls negative guidance doesn't mean negative earnings. It just means they came in below consensus. So if, if you were expecting a 10% growth and they said, now nah, we're only going to get seven, that's a negative um, guidance. So And then the Fed. What are they going to do? Right. We, we, we had Powell's testimony last week where he 
pretty much completely killed the 50 basis point okay. increase. So we can say, okay, they're not going to do the 50 basis points. They're not going to do it. He fully supports the 25 basis points. We're going to find out next week. And the market says no chance for zero. Something's going to happen. So that leads us right in the middle of probably where Powell is. The market says 5% chance of zero. Oh, 5%. Chance. Yeah, which is new. So basically no chance of zero. He, he said he's supporting 25. He's, he's going to get 25. Would, is that going to make a difference though? No. Uh, we, we've been saying that for a while. Two, three, four increases in, in rates this year is like spitting into the ocean for inflation. It's not going to do anything. It's, it's basically symbolic at this point, um, and they're going to have to do it. The question is, will it have an effect? And that really is the question. Are, are, are they tightening into a market that's already pretty tight? And that's what Goldman came out with this week. They run their own uh, financial conditions uh, metric, and they're saying, Markets are already really tight right now. Credit spreads are widening. Commodity prices are blowing out. The Fed could hide behind that. We're, we're going to find out. But they, they, they think it's uh, premature to start throwing on some. And I guess if it doesn't really affect the other rates across the yield curve and it only affects the window rate, then it, it probably doesn't matter anyways because there's still going to be plenty of money to, to keep it at 25 basis points. Yeah. So uh, they may have jawboned the rates to where they are. And so them doing it doesn't really change anything. Uh, I am seeing a lot of uh, what some would call clickbait or, uh, or just fear to, to drive it, which is the demise of the dollar uh, through this. And uh, there's uh, quite the argument that uh, is being made, and I think there is some credibility to it uh, long term, but not short term. Uh, the, uh, the, the dollar is, is just absolutely embedded in the global market, and it would, just, it would not be possible to quickly replace it in, uh, in, in a short term. Uh, and in addition, as we had talked about, the, where are you, you going to go? The other currencies are even less desirable uh, th than the dollar. I do think that there's some long-term damages here, though. Uh, so if you have reserves as a, a country and the, the U.S. or the NATO allies are, can just decide to cut you off from those reserves, did you ever really have those reserves? No, you had a liability. Uh, and, and now the chance of the U.S. coming in or, or, the, uh, or the others uh, NATO, the alliance, whoever is going to make these decisions, Germany was very much involved in this SWIFT decision. Uh, we, that's got to be part of y your thinking. So what do you do with that? And there's already other areas. I know the, uh, China and, and Russia are, are trying to build their own uh, currency uh, component. Uh, but the rule of law, uh, if you can just have your reserves confiscated without uh, due process, certainly is a detractor long term. Uh, and historically, the U.S. has had a low uh, debt, the GDP, uh, which means stable monetary policy long term. I don't think the dollar or anybody really has that anymore. Uh, the U.S. also used to be a very large manufacturing hub, so at least you could exchange the dollars that you had in reserves for tangible goods and bring them over a way to ex export it. I don't think you have to worry about the demise of the dollar, uh, at, at least tomorrow. Uh, it, it's here and it's quite embedded. Uh, alternatives, it's Tina. There, just yeah. is, there is no alternative, really. Uh, any other comments? Yeah, that, was, that was a good summary. All right. Well, we appreciate you tuning in. If you haven't subscribed, uh, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Uh, and if you uh, uh, like the, the, uh, the Market Insight, hit that like button. Always hit that arrow to share it with your friends if you think it will be beneficial to them. And don't forget to reach out and let us know if you have uh, any questions. Uh, if, if you're a client and you want to speak to your elite advisor, call the number on the screen. Uh, if you are somebody just watching and you'd like to have somebody review your portfolio, uh, go ahead and call that as well, and, and we'll, we'll definitely have a conversation with you. Thanks, and we'll see you next week.